Ghost Song is a Metroidvania released in November of 2022. It's an experience defined by wondering if everything you meet is secretly waiting to pull a calculated switcheroo on you. Are these people robots? Are you a robot? Or maybe a spaceship? Is this door a dude? What is and isn't an AI? Surrounded by robots and confusion. Of course, this is just daily existence for us here in 2023. That's why I replaced myself with a robot cloned version of myself. For the sake of your immersion. You couldn't tell. Don't even act like you could. I'm so lifelike. I'm a real boy. Alright, that's just about enough of that, I think. Hello, I'm your host, for real this time. And let's talk about Ghost Song. What you're seeing here, esteemed viewer, was originally financed in the now medieval era of 2014. It was dragged to reality through years of consistent effort. And three different engines, if I'm reading this right. Thematically speaking, it's a very moody and somber game. Don't let this cute Furby guy fool you. I mean, the dude might make squeaky toy noises when he fights, but for every one of these guys, there's a corpse in soft mood lighting somewhere. So uh, join me if you want to see a dead body. And spoilers. But like, somber spoilers. You put, you know, like, put, put a frowny face, yeah. So the story of Ghost Song begins with the stirring of a dead suit, a type of machine whose specialty is generating questions about what the hell it is. Poking around a bit, it's not too hard to deduce that we're looking at one of these declining kingdom situations. What with all the parasitic bugs and the decorative applications of spines. You poke around a bit more, you'll find the skeleton of a working Metroid system. With real big bones, because it don't move a lot. The plain and simple truth is that if you play all the way through Ghost Song, you're not going to do it because you find the gameplay novel or exceptional. I know a respectable amount of the internet would stick around just for the chance to look for waifus, but that's not really what this game is about either. Also, they're rabid zombies, so that's at least some of those people gone as well. Pro probably not a majority. If you stick around, you're going to do it for the atmosphere. I don't know whether it was the ambience or the introspective writing, but there was definitely something here that made me take a second, closer look. We stumble across a shipwrecked crew, struggling to repair their ship, and we altruistically agree to help. In the process, we learn that the very personable ship AI considers us to be an entity similar to itself, though we can't be sure exactly what we are or how we came to be here. What we receive in exchange for our help is a smattering of interesting world building and an extremely generous, suspiciously generous, portion of personal thoughts. Thoughts about how you like to pace your day. Thoughts about how you grew up on a farm. Here's some thoughts about what it feels like to be on the ground as a spaceship. The people in this group are the emotional center of the story. And you would hope so, because getting to know people this well and not catching feelings would be weird. I know these people better than my personal friends, and that's strictly because my personal friends will sometimes keep things to themselves. Plus or minus for this one, I think, depends on who you are. It can lead to meditations that skirt the edges of this fictional universe and give it interesting, ponderous character. Take, for instance, the android who is contemplating her new body after being damaged in the wreck. How did the features of her previous self define her experience? With total control over one's physical vessel, how does one remain certain that only imperfections are discarded and not intrinsic parts of the self? What is the criteria of a flaw? This is the conversation dudes have in the mirror when they decide to shave their balding head, by the way. I do think conversations like this, and some of the ones with the ship about spaceflight, make the world feel different, out of the contemporary. But I could also say that because some of them are so removed from what's even happening inside of the game, they feel like they don't really go anywhere. For example, this guy. Will you ask him if he's the leader? And he goes into this whole song and dance about how they have a non-hierarchical organization that directs itself uniquely based on expertise and he, how he feels about the appearance of being of leadership and he would prefer that because the modes of patterns of thought, good God, it's a swing and a miss for me, Chief, no. Since I've finished the game and I know what's going on here, I can tell you what you're supposed to see in this. You, the player, are easy to talk to for these people there's an unexplainable connection between you. But there's definitely a shorter way to get that across, because it feels like these people, surrounded by screaming zombies that explode, or they're really just focused on their memoirs right now, thanks. More on that later. In order to even get to know these philosophy majors that well, we've been bringing them spaceship parts. This isn't too hard because the place is lousy with spaceships, but it does involve actually playing the video game. So let's talk gameplay. Actually, no, I don't want to. You can't make me. Let's talk atmosphere. A big strength for Ghost Song here is the ambience, which is held up by a mesh of reverb-heavy electric guitar canoodles.
If you searched up psychedelic space rock, you, you wouldn't be surprised to hear this right there with it. Actually, for me, it, it sort of makes me think of grunge music. I can't give a quantitative reason, but I feel that it fit right there next to the bizarre forest of high fives and the exploding zombies and the people having their exceptionally big think. An empty, bombed out space graveyard is a great place for introspection. We got that going. But it would be kind of a challenging place to have engaging gameplay, or now that I think about it, better example, engaging design. Here's the thing. This world is small. Well, because it's not a world, it's a moon. Oh, technicalities, baby. But more importantly, it's small because this is a nine hour game with about two hours of pointless repeats. See, whenever you find a spaceship part, fast travel is disabled. This is the first half of an okay idea. The second half of that idea goes like this. The return path will be slightly different. It's an upside down pizza hut. I've filled it with fish. Mostly the band, but there are some piranha. A donkey is chasing you. God took an ambient. It's just me here now. But we did not get that okay idea. What we got was, now you traverse the same map backwards, with nearly no change whatsoever. Let me make a call back to that thing I said before. Anime watches out there would call this filler. They don't mean that as a compliment. Like it's not filling the way broccoli is. It's filling in the way where you don't want to do it. Okay, actually, I guess that's kind of similar to broccoli. See, going through the same map twice is not a great game plan because even on a good day, sometimes the enemies are just not there. Talking about broccoli made me sad. And when I'm sad, that's when I know that it's time to talk about the gameplay. There are a couple of aspects of this, but the biggest one that stuck out to me was enemy attack patterns. Yeah, the plural on that's only just barely required. See, because for most bosses, phase one is one pattern, and phase two is another pattern. A lot of them just ask you to find the jump button. Maybe y'all think I'm cherry picking. Here's the last boss. The music and the gameplay here are on two totally different planets of hype. I've never seen so few patterns in all my years. And my years are many. I have played many, many, many side-scrolling action games. I could jump and shoot and dodge bullet on life support. Understand? Cuphead only made me like 10% mad. Looking at it through that lens, I'm a little bit biased, right? That's what I prefer to do. So I'm going to dial back my opinion here from my initial reaction, which was somewhat negative. So here's my less knee-jerk, more constructive criticism. The keystone differentiating mechanic for Ghost Song is its heat. As you shoot more bullets and fire more weapons, your gun builds up heat. Overheating makes your melee attacks deal more damage. This heat is also transferred to your carried weapons, although I'm not sure exactly how it gets there. But I can tell you why it gets there. For hundreds of years, men setting out to make games like these have asked themselves a simple question. How can we make it make sense to bash stuff over the head with a hammer when we have a space laser? Melee weapons are just cooler. I mean, if you don't believe me, just take a look at this giant robot Hulk hand that lets you unlock a martial art. Sheev Fu. Look, I'm no poet worthy of the people in this game, but I do know something about human nature. The heart wants what the heart wants, and the heart want bonk. But you know, you can't just give bonk and not do anything to make it safe, you know? For example, a little bit bigger reach, or more predictable staggering of bosses, you know, because you're right next to them. Or the biggest thing for me is dashing. Since the dash takes you a fixed distance, well, it has to, it's the dodge roll, it's really easy to miss space with it and just end up closer than you wanted to be. Really, I wish more games did this like an old classic Mega Man Zero, where you could release the dash at any time and stop dashing. But I mean, that's not fair. Even Hollow Knight has a couple of things it could learn from Mega Man Zero. Somebody out there just said, Subjective. Well, hang on. Let me let me just uh, cite my sources. I could go into quite a quite a lot of detail about the story and how it wraps up here, but I'm already behind schedule, so we're gonna fast track this. So we got all these things in place. Ships keep crashing into the planet, and there's zombie bugs that drive people crazy and turn them into trees. And there's the occasional ghost, you know, like from the title. The good news is that there is a significant prose bomb towards the end that unifies all this stuff. It's a little fantastical. There's super science, and at one point I actually said, 
Wouldn't that make them space ghosts? The terms of engagement governing this situation are all... I still don't understand. You don't need to understand. It's nothing to do with you. Above our pay grade, none of the parties involved will listen to us, and unless we get them to bend a little bit, the ship-crashing magic that surrounds the planet will stay up, and the people we met won't be able to leave and will eventually die. My personal take on it is that it paints a canvas, not a character. What do I mean by that? I think of it like a history textbook. History can be extremely interesting, but if you ever hear anybody talk about traditional storytelling, they'll tell you, a story lives and dies on its characters. People care mainly about people. You need a compelling character to tell a story. From that point of view, the core of our story and where we really expect to see resolution is over here with the crew and with ourselves. Who are we and why can't we remember? The super science characters and the forces of their forever war are less compelling because they're all effectively impassive soldiers carrying out their roles without a distinct motivation. The primary character trait for one of them is that he doesn't speak or interact anymore. He just science. So I'm really surprised that conclusive resolution for who you are as a character and why the crew are the centers for you is so well hidden. Behind what might be one of the trickiest places to recognize as a path in the game. Without discovering this secret, you'll go to the ending still not knowing what the hell your personal stake is in this. Let me just wrap it up this way. You can decide if this game is worth it based solely on if you like these people. Earlier, when I was making fun of them and calling them philosophy majors, somebody out there, probably somewhere in a coffee shop, said, I'm a direct descendant of Immanuel Kant. How dare you? And my response to that, aside from the obvious, which would be, shut up Kant, is that I'm generally the type who just doesn't like people, so probably that means these people who doubt themselves and overthink things at me are very convincingly human-like. And so you probably won't have a hard time deciding if you like them or not. That's it. Thanks for watching.